Right, well, that's, first of all, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming as well. Thank you for the register for asking me. And it's a certain amount of trepidation because we know how, as a regular reader of the register, we know how gentle they can be with people and caring and, you know, so um, fingers crossed, anyhow. Um, right, I want to tell you a little bit about how the museum, how the museum came about, how we started, and how, what we've learnt over the last um, eight years and how the museum's changed because of that. Um, and I know everybody sort of tends to groan, but we, when the museum was founded, Tony Sale and I put together a mission statement. I don't think we ground, groans at mission statements, but it was to collect and restore computer systems, particularly those in the UK, uh, and then we were to enable people to explore that for inspiration, learning and enjoyment. And we'll come back to this mission statement later on. Um, initially we thought, okay, well we, we, we had a reasonably good collection anyhow, what are we going to do with that collection? And certain elements of those inspiration, learning and enjoyment have become much, much bigger than we ever possibly imagined. Uh, we started, we were a, a sort of an amateur small collection on the edges of Bletchley Park for many, many years. Um, but we were established properly as a sort of charity and a national museum in 2008. As, uh, as was said, the bulk of the workforce are volunteers. There are five trustees, and I'm one of them, and our job is mainly to worry about the money, to be frank. Um, three and a half full-time staff that look after the operation, the day-to-day -day operation of the museum and then over 90 volunteers. And those volunteers are engineers who are restoring systems, guides, uh, we're showing people around the museum every day now, um, admin people in the, ad in the um, staff, and I missed off the, the learning section, a group of people responsible for the school visits. We'll come on to school visits later, but that's a big key part of what we do. Now I came, came involved in 1999. There was a message out on probably a news group at that point saying, is anybody any help or any knowledge of PDP-11 based systems? Uh, and there was one that needed restoring at the museum. And I happened to see this, turned up on one Saturday to be presented with this uh, poorly PDP-11, got that fixed and back onto display, and then went back every single Saturday after that. And in 2008, when the building that we were in was under threat, we then formed the, the, uh, the National Museum. Tony Sale, who will come on to shortly, uh, promised me it would take me about five minutes, ten minutes a week of my time. Well, I had the first two years off from work just to get the museum actually established. Um, so um, it's no longer a full-time job now that we've got staff, but I'm sort of fully involved still. Um, when we set the museum up, we went around and looked at other museums, established museums, and computing museums abroad as well. And there are some beautiful museums out there displaying objects in beautiful glass cases, fantastically lit, beautifully presented, uh, hands-off signs everywhere, and the sort of museum we walk around in silence. Uh, British Library, the Science Museum as well, perfect examples of this. Um, fantastic collection of artefacts, beautifully displayed. You've got Rodin's sculpture there. Everything you need to know, or can know, about that sculpture, you can see by standing in front of it, walking around it. Perhaps a bit of research about Rodin's life. But everything that can be understood about that can be seen standing the other side of the glass case. Now, Perhaps you can do the same with computer museums. That is the single most impressive modern mainframe-ish computer that I can find visually. Um, the bulk of them look grey cabinets. We've all got racks and racks of grey cabinets. That's the most impressive I can find. And it would look terrific in a museum. It would look terrific in our museum. If anybody's got one, then uh, we'd be very interested to know. You can see examples of machines like this, beautifully presented at things like the Computer History Museum in California. But there's so little that you can actually tell. We, 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 we believe computers are a very special case. Then you cannot understand, possibly, that machine without it running. That's a key part of all that we do. 
Now, the, it was mentioned before the Colossus Rebuild project. Before it became the Sandwich's Museum, Tony Sale had set up this project to rebuild the Colossus computer. Now, I think a lot of people know the story, but um, the Colossus computer was put together 43, 44, as a code cracking machine to crack the Lorentz cipher, which is one degree uh, more secure and complicated than the Enigma machine that people tend to know about. Tony knew a little bit about the Colossus machine, and the story was actually coming out of that point, but all that was left was scraps of circuit diagrams, uh, the odd engineer with odd memories and so on. But Tony gathered together enough information to start rebuilding Colossus. Now, it was mentioned earlier that um, we, Tony rebuilt Colossus II. Tony was not allowed to rebuild Colossus II. He was given permission to rebuild Colossus I with a nod from those in power in Cheltenham. But Tony, being the sort of person he was, built Colossus II anyhow. So there's still some concern over that. Um, we have a video now. This was... Right, the Colossus One. They dis oh, here we go. Briefly, um, for the layman. For the lay, for the for the very layman. Um, it's part of C Colossus. Didn't do the whole job. There was this, uh, there's this idea that you you put a sort of tape, a paper tape on Colossus, and you'll see that in a moment, of encrypted German traffic, and lo and behold, several hours later, as the machine clicked away, out would print legible German not the way it works at all. There's a big job before it. All Colossus enabled was finding a couple of the wheel positions, the way this, this Lorentz machine was set up originally. And Colossus 1 was built to do that, uh, with the success and the understanding that Colossus 1 was actually viable. Because there's obviously a huge amount of doubt at that point whether a machine with 1,500 valves in it was even, would even work, work for more than five minutes. But with the knowledge that Colossus 1 was available, they extended into Colossus 2 to decode more of the wheel settings. Now this video is a bit um, in the style of a sort of path, path A news presentation, so we're going to have to talk over some of it. We had a problem with the sound, so fingers crossed. What? The problem, and the problem, or the reason why Colossus it's security. The worry is that the, 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 the algorithms and the techniques that, you, that Colossus uses, Colossus 2 particularly uses, to, to decrypt that sort of cipher called the Vernon cipher is still valid now. Um, the problem, uh, things like you know, Colossus, there was a story that Colossus were dis destroyed at the end of the war and broken up. Absolutely not true at all. Um, the majority were, dis were um, dismantled and parts distributed, but two carried on for 20 odd years afterwards in full use. And the reason it was secure and, and, and secret was not because of any technology particularly used in the machine, but that, that knowledge that the British were able to decode and decipher a, an encrypted message of that standard. And that was important because you know, if you want to encourage everybody else to carry on using that sort of encryption, you don't tell them you can decode it. I, I, I'm never terribly sure where we were selling them, but we weren't. We were, we were, we were giving the nod, certainly to our allies, the Canadians, the Australians, and so on. That yes, of course, it's secure. You can carry on using that, no problem at all. Meanwhile, of course, we were carried on. Um, uh, Actually, nothing changes, of course, because of the NSA this morning and French, you know, nothing ever changes at all. I'll show you the video. Uh, I've got three videos to show you, two short ones, which we'll do shortly, and then one that puts them all together at the end. We had a problem with sound earlier. Uh, the museum's Mac is showing its age, has a VGA connector. Uh, nobody has VGA anymore. So we might have a problem with the sound. We've got the video working, sound we'll see. Uh, what am I doing? I have to click. There. As I say, we deliberately turned it into a sort of newsreel presentation. Not that this was ever be. I need a 
flat cap really and a sort of military moustache to actually go and cover this. Um, as I was saying earlier, the messages are punched on paper, on paper tape and it's the paper tape that you can see spinning around there. One of the key things about Colossus is Colossus didn't have any memory at all. They hadn't cracked the idea of memory at that point. It's got processing, it's got branching, it's got logical switching, logical operations, but no memory. So the tape has the message in a loop and that replays at 5,000 characters a second every two or three, well, about every five seconds. And each time through that loop, on each character, we're doing about 100, 150 logical operations at 5,000 characters a second. So it's an extremely quick machine. Um, having said that, uh, a typical run to find out the first of the few wheel settings of the Lorenz machine would probably take six hours. We did a challenge, a cipher challenge, a few years ago uh, where we transmitted uh, over wireless an encrypted message and encouraged people to, de to download that, no, not download it even initially, to receive that message and actually then write their own code to decrypt it. Um, it was won by a chap in Germany, which is a certain little ir irony about this, <laughs> who um, was able to receive the message um, uh, with normal radio kit, got it into his PC on a, on a cluster of PCs with code he'd written from square one in Ada, had the whole message cracked in about 30 seconds. But Colossus would have taken six hours. In comparison though, if you were doing it by hand, which is what they'd been doing before Colossus came on stream, it would take about six weeks. And six weeks for an intelligence message, it's all over, it's all wasted by that stage. So six hours was quite fantastic. When the machine was actually proven, um, almost immediately after the first machine, another six were ordered, and eventually there were 10 actually, last one wasn't assembled, but 10 in place. And the important part of where we are at Bletchley Park, in what's called Block H, was actually one of the centers where the Colossus machines uh, were installed and running and the rebuild is in the exact position of Colossus of one of those Colossus machines and Block H itself was the world's first purpose-built computer center built solely for the Colossus machines so it's really perfect for us as a location that was a modern that was a modern machine that's right that's, that's oh yeah but modern ciphers must be much more you know, yes Yes. Which you can decode on, you know, low-level computers in, you know, fractions of a second. Why does it still take 30 seconds to crack this? Is it, I mean, is it different to a public private Why, um, why are you talking 30 seconds? I don't know. I, you, it's just a good point, actually. Of course, you're using, I mean, he's actually written this from square one himself, actually. Right. And I think a lot of that was actually sort of, I don't know, it's, it's a very good point. I don't know why it took him 30 seconds in that case. It's a good point, actually, because you're right. I will find out. Yes. So I think what we've, what we've decided is, in fact, the working museum is absolutely important. We, we, it, it's, it's the only way of actually presenting, we believe, the, actual, the history of computing. But it has its challenges. This is just, it's not a terribly flattering photograph. It's five cabinets of an ICL 2966 mainframe. Now I'm not going to go as somebody in the audience that knows exactly which is the, um, or several people probably, which, which is in which cabinet, but that acts as the processor. That's not enough to get a working system. To get a working system, you need all of that to go with it. In the distance there, you can see 2966. It's an end shot of those five process cabinets. So to get a working system, we've got at the back, right in the distance, uh, four tape decks. There are two card readers in front of it, at least one line printer, the two operator consoles, the processors, and then this huge array of disk drives. Now we wanted deliberately to have all of those out to give an idea of exactly how big a mainframe was and that's sort of in the 80s. And in fact this is only half <coughs> this is only half the machine that actually originally came from Tarmac. It has its challenges, of course, because we have school children in every day of the week. 
and they see this machine and it's a real wow factor. So how powerful is it? Wow. Okay. How much memory has it got? How much disk space has it got? I mean, the kids are really sort of clued up and they know exactly how much memory is in their laptops and their um, iPhones and so on. So, the answer to the question is how much memory has it got in terms of RAM? It's got 64K. <laughs> well, okay, that's a problem because you don't have to explain what K is because they're working on um, several orders of magnitude higher than that already. Um, so we need to scale that down. And then questions like how powerful it is. Well, that's, that's something that we struggle with all the while. Um, because how do you measure how powerful it is? <clears throat> this machine in its heyday would be supporting several hundred users. And you can't operate, seven, you can't 700 users, several hundred users can't operate one iPhone. So we've, over the years, we've tried to put together calculations to say, well, let's have the number of users squared, because uh, that's in our favor, multiplied by the clock speed and so on, to try and work out power you know, relationships. It's, it's a difficult problem. So uh, working machines are important to us. Um, one of the machines that came to us almost by accident uh, has turned out to be such a fantastic story in itself. And this is a machine that was built or designed in the 90, early 1950s. Uh, and it was the first electronic computer that was um, used at Harwell, at the Atomic Energy Research Establishment uh, at Harwell in the 50s. Um, it is an electronic stored program computer, was built um, using technology that the guys at Harwell knew, uh, not to be the fastest machine in the world by a long chalk. In fact, it's a remarkably slow machine, but that turns out to be quite useful. But it was very reliable. And at the time, the mean time before failure of most of its competitors, like EDSAC, would have been hours at the absolute most and more likely to be minutes. Whereas this machine would quite reliably carry on uh, for weeks on end uh, without attention. Which is actually very useful because when I say it's slow, um, division would take about 15, 16 seconds. Um, but having said that, because it was reliable, because jobs could be stacked up for the machine on paper tape, it could be left unattended for days and weeks. And it was typically used solving uh, mathematical problems for Harwell, printing out tables. Now we'll have a bit of a video of that. This, uh, I'll tell you how it came to the museum. Harwell used it in, from 1950 to 1957. The guys at Harwell then didn't want to simply dismantle it or, did, or throw it away. And it was actually part of a competition, but it was given to Wolverhampton College of Technology and they used it for teaching, and they used the machine for teaching the, the first undergraduate computer course in the UK. They used it until, really, until about the mid-70s. Um, I think about 70, I think about 73. And then it was transferred, they didn't want to destroy it either, so it was transferred to Birmingham Science Museum. Before they transferred it, though, they had it registered with the Guinness Book of Records as the world's most durable computer. I should come back to that in a second. It was transferred to Birmingham Science Museum. It was on display. I can remember it being on display for a very short time and then was broken up into storage and wasn't rediscovered again until really 2000, uh, 2007, 2008. And then the machine was actually brought back to the museum. When we found it, we found just part of the computer itself in a warehouse in Birmingham. And we found a few more parts of it, and we discovered, I thought at that point, if we find half of the machine, we can probably rebuild the rest. It's worth doing this. But in fact, in practice, we found over 90, 95% of the machine um, are spread around and broken up in really quite a poor state. Uh, and it took several years for that machine to be restored. Um, when it was restored, we had, uh, I should tell you something else before that as well. The way that the actual story effectively changed, initially it's an engineering challenge about how to put this machine back together again. How to actually understand how it was modified over the years because we had some circuit diagrams. 
But at the same time, we then actually managed to get in touch with the original designers of the machine, who were still living in the Oxford area. So we were able to go out to those designers, who were well into their 80s and 90s, to talk to them. We also found the class, the first undergraduate class at Wolverhampton College of Technology, that used the machine for their, um, for their degree. A small group, but 18 students, 18-year-olds, 18 used the machine for three years and graduated. Just before they graduated, IBM visited the college to see what was, what was being taught and how it was being taught, and actually employed everybody from the class. Uh, and all but two or three of them went off to work for IBM until they retired. That group, as a retirees, have since been back to see the machine. And the number of stories that we're finding out by having the machine available and being talked about is quite phenomenal. We, when the machine was completed, we held an event called the Reboot Event. There was a lot of coverage of this on the TV. Uh, and a short video was put on YouTube just before Christmas. And over Christmas, that hit over, I had over a million hits on YouTube, went completely viral, which is absolutely no, one, no understanding of why this happened at all. We've got me in the middle. There's the two designers um, to my left and two of the users on the left-hand side. Now, if I go into the video, this is just part of it. I'd been talking for about, I suppose, an hour at that stage. Delwyn, who's in the middle of the screen with almost with his back to us, is waiting to start the machine. And I think he'd spent the last hour and a half sweating, waiting for me to say start. Uh, it's a very short video, but there's a sort of longer clip towards the end. Now, the time has actually come, Delwyn. Can you actually run a programme for us? I hope so. Right. <laughs> so we'll let it run. And now you can see a row of nines appearing in the queue all the time. From memory, it's multiplying 3 by 3.3. Now that's being printed out on, on the printer. And the answer was 9.999, so perfect. Um, you get an idea of the, the machine is very slow, but that's absolutely perfect. If we've got this class, um, anything from, from teenagers, um, university students, and we're teaching them programming, we're teaching the fundamentals of computer hardware, we can single step through this machine. This machine is exactly the same as any modern computer. It has a store, has an ALU, uh, has input and output, and we can step through that. The wonderful thing is you saw the store, these are these Decatron tubes, which are sort of uh, cold cathode tubes with the end with a sort of um, a neon glow that sits in any of 10 positions. Well, of course, if you're actually teaching programming, and you want to say, well, OK, well, let's load the accumulator with what's in store 27. We can go up and look at store 27 and read what's in there. Hit the button to single step that. A few seconds later, we'll get that value in the accumulator. And that's absolutely perfect. The fact it's big and noisy as well is fantastic with kids. Um, so we encourage them to all the, the, the order code, the operation, the example programs are all online. So we encourage people to actually write programs and bring programs along, and we punch that on tape for them. There's a longer video at the end. We reckon this machine's had four, this is its fourth charmed life. It had a life at Harwell, then at Wolverhampton, then Birmingham Science Museum, and then it's now back with us. When it was restored back to working order, we had Guinness Book of Records back in to revalidate that, um, that award and it's still down now as the world's most durable computer. And I think, therefore, no one's going to overtake us now, then, are they? So uh, we're really we're pleased with that machine. Um, it's been really wonderful. And the stories that we've got from that uh, have been incredible. I think that was a sort of university, I think it's the undergraduate course. Um, but it has been so quite inspiring, really, I think. 
I talked about working systems and the required resources. If you're going to have systems restored and working, you need high quality engineers. And that's why the, our, our volunteers are so important to us. No museum could afford the quality of engineers that we need to restore the machines, to operate them, to program them. Um, these, like the ICL 2966, are very complex, sophisticated machines. Um, require system programmers, um, user programmers, uh, operators, uh, and guides to actually explain that. One of the things is when some machine's working, is how do you actually demonstrate? How do you actually give an impression of what this machine did in real life? Um, our, our volunteers, uh, particularly the engineers, are absolutely invaluable for that. It wouldn't really be possible without that. In terms of visitors, the visitor numbers are growing and growing and growing. Uh, we see about over 25,000 a year at the moment. Everything from fa families, whole families will come. And so it's important for us that, as well as the hardware and the systems, there are the stories that go with it. Who operated the machine? Um, we have a whole gallery on women in computing that were actually, it's a pretty untold story. So that's important to us as well. And the guided tours as well. The guided tours, there's a horrible term in museum talk, the rivet counters, the people that will come to the museum that will want to see that particular machine and that particular version <laughs> of that machine. And that's fine because we will have that machine, it can be brought out, terrific. But for families, we run guided tours to explain the history and explain what they're looking at. Four and a half thousand students every year. Um, school, chil school children from seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds upwards, A-level students. Uh, we now are at capacity, so we are fully booked for something like the next nine months in terms of students. So we're actually having to sort of find extra space around us to actually carry on and grow those, such is the demand, such is the demand from schools um, to teach. We're not just showing students. Students do typically about an hour on the history of computing. And then we spend the bulk of the time on something practical. That's typically coding. Um, that's, not, that's one of the classrooms. One of the machines that's turned out to be fantastic for us in teaching programming is the BBC Micro from 1984. Um, as far as the, the teachers are concerned, there's no internet access. So that's a definite plus. Uh, you switch it on and you're at the program prompt, the program prompt straight away. It's very easy to write code. It's very easy to get quick graphical sound results as well, which is great for the kids. It's a structured basic. It's still basic, but it's a structured language. For the 18-year-olds, uh, the A-level computer course now includes an appreciation of what machine code is and what assembler code is. Now, schools have no chance of teaching that. Um, one of the teachers told us... Um, the problem we have is that we can't afford the most up-to-date machines to teach them assembly code. Well, the idea of teaching somebody assembly, Intel assembly code is just, God, oh, the, the addressing modes is about that thick. So we use things like PDP-8s, which are a 12-bit machine with half a dozen instructions, or the hardware machine. And that works fantastically well. It's an easy machine to actually understand. And it gets over that, the appreciation of what machine code is and what assembly code is. We're talking about the summer bites as well. Such is the demand, in fact, out of school hours from uh, families and school children to understand the fundamentals of digital net technology of programming that we actually run fest uh, bites festivals in each of the summer holidays and weekend courses, codability courses. They've been incredible. The demand has been quite phenomenal, actually, uh, and, and outstripping our sort of capacity to fill it, hence the sort of trying to grow to, to answer that. The, uh, we talked about the Cypher Challenge earlier. We work with other museums. Uh, there's a big exchange of artifacts and information from museums nationally and internationally as well. So we're forever borrowing items or lending items to the Americans and to the, to the Germans as well. That's important to us, and I think that, that will grow, uh, and potentially exchanging people as well on a sort of internship from museum to museum. museum. We talked about funding and support. Uh, 
we have, it was a huge struggle at the start, absolutely, you know, um, really, a, a real, we, we reckoned for the first several years we had three months cash in the bank and we keep going for three months and it was always three months. So we always had three months ahead and that just about going. It's now getting better, as we become more known, uh, people are more generous and, and, uh, and donating to the museum. The membership list as well is really growing. So we have an active member thing that they get extra information and invitations to new galleries as well. That's important to us. Um, and obviously entrance fees and guided tours. We also run quite a lot in terms of sponsor days and sort of uh, corporate events. How are we doing? Yep. Um, a little bit about the future. This is a, it's a new gallery that we've opened uh, in association with National Air Traffic Control Services. When we started very early on, we, it coincided with the closure of um, the Air Traffic Control Centre at West Drayton in North London. And we worked with them to actually rescue or recover the last air traffic control station from West Drayton. And it's the first time that we've done something in quite that detail that um, one or two of our guys spent a week being trained how to use this system at West Drayton and understand exactly what was being restored uh, 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 and what was being collected. So we collected all of the machines that we needed, the, da the actual the data communication equipment, the system logs, the manuals, the backup tapes, everything to bring that machine back. And the machine was restored to working order um, and has generated a lot of interest. And air traffic control services came back to us about 18 months ago and said, fantastic what you've done, can we add to it our latest generation of air traffic control systems? And that's what we're looking at here. Um, the gallery actually sweeps around. What we're looking at there is a 3D, uh, not 3D, um, a view out over the um, apron at Gatwick Airport with live feeds of, of planes coming in and taking off. Um, and that's growing. We will we will grow that each year on year, we'll update that and add that latest technology. And that's running alongside the original PDP-11 big green screen displayed systems. I promise you this video to link a couple of things together. The BBC runs something called the uh, Antiques Road Trip, uh, sort of seven o'clock weekday afternoons. Uh, it's partly going out and finding antiques, then reselling antiques. But halfway through the program, they go off and find some twerp in a shed that collects thimbles or something, or um, odd-shaped vegetables and so on. Uh, and this week it was me. Uh, so I was the twerp in the shed with a sort of bigger shed and bigger machines. There's a little bit of preamble at the start, but it's actually a really quite nice video of both Colossus, the rebuild, and of the hardware machine. This morning they're starting in Bletchley, which like Fenny Stratford is now part of Milton Keynes. The town grew with the arrival of the railways in the 19th century. It's now synonymous with code breaking during the Second World War at Bletchley Park. It's also recognised as the place where some of the earliest computers were used to break encrypted messages of the Hitler regime. These revolutionary devices have now grown to dominate almost every aspect of our modern lives. They've changed the way we communicate, move around the planet, and played a major role in globalization. In fact, life without them is almost unimaginable. But back in Bletchley in the 1940s, they only did one thing, and Paul's come to the National Museum of Computing to find out how these machines went from top secret code breakers to one of the world's most used objects with the help of museum curator Kevin Murrell. That's enough of him, thank Ooh. God he's gone. Is it Kevin? Hello, Paul. Good to see you. Hello, Paul. That's a toy. It is. This is the Colossus computer. This is the machine that was developed in the middle of the Second World War to decrypt the most secure transmissions uh, from the sort of, um, Berlin headquarters of the Nazi regime. Previously, people had been able to decrypt messages slowly by hand, but this level of messages required automation. So this is the first electronic computer that was built to solve that problem. 
Colossus was designed by telephone engineer Tommy Flowers, who had the idea of using electronics to power an automated machine. This allowed workers at Bletchley Park to decode each message in about six hours, something that had previously taken six weeks. We are doing this here at Bletchley during the war, and it's top secret. Is there anything comparable going on, albeit in isolation, elsewhere? Not, not quite to the same degree. The Americans were here as well. The Americans were actually, there were quite a, quite a quite a team of Americans working here. No, no one could take one of these with them. No one could take the Soviet dragons. But everyone left with the knowledge of the fact that you could build a machine on this scale to do that job. Yeah. Although cutting edge for its time, Colossus was designed to perform one task. But a major breakthrough came a few years later when engineers at the Harwell Atomic Energy Research Establishment in nearby Oxfordshire designed a machine that could be programmed for multiple uses. And this two and a half ton Harwell Decatron computer was the result. This is a general purpose computer. So in principle, it can do anything we want. Unlike Colossus, which is very much tailored to that one job. Originally designed to do mathematical calculations, Programs punched into paper tape could be loaded into the machine's memory to tell the computer what to do. In this case, it's the two times table. Oh, what a noise! You know what that noise is? That's Robbie the robot thinking, isn't it? Well, it's it even go to the thinking stage yet. What it's doing, it's reading that program into these into the memory of the computer. And this this is the memory of the computer. This is the oldest original working electronic stored program computer in the world. It only has the memory to store the equivalent of a few lines of email, but its significance cannot be underestimated. It's functionally, it's identical to every modern computer. Just a bit bigger, just a lot bigger, and you should see the size of the battery. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I'm never going to forget these beasts, are you? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All the best. It's incredible to think that work by engineers and mathematicians only 70 years ago has led to these devices becoming part of our everyday lives. And back in the Sunday, Thomas is calculating his own life changing. Right. Thank you very much, everybody. I think um, time for a drink. <laughs>